I want to talk, comrades and friends, about uh, a global water crisis in which we know that the world is actually running out of water. And that wasn't supposed to happen. It wasn't supposed to be able to happen because we were all taught back in, I don't know, grade three or six or whatever, that there's a, fi there's a cycle. When it rains, the water falls from the clouds down all the way to the ground. It soaks into the ground and then the grass and trees grow. Sometimes there's so much water underground that lakes and rivers just pop up, like when you squeeze a box of apple juice. The rivers carry the water back to the ocean. Inside the ocean, the water floats up to the sky as clouds again. Then the wind pushes the clouds towards the land and it rains again. This all happens over and over, forever and ever. How important is water in your life? We all know that just as our bodies, the planetary organism we call home is nearly 70% water. However, only 3% of this resource is fresh water. Currently, this precious resource is at risk of being impure forever. We are trying to get more people aware about the Energy East pipeline. They're looking to carry 1.1 million barrels of bitumen across our entire country every single day. The Energy East pipeline is a, a really a reckless plan to move Alberta tar sands uh, diluted bitumen 4,500 kilometers across the country to the East Coast to be loaded onto ships for export. Uh, we've studied the risks and the rewards of such a pipeline and we uh, realize that it's pretty much all risk and very little reward for us here in Northwest Ontario. I think the recent derailments in Northern Ontario are worrisome, but we have no reason to believe that uh, the Energy East Pipeline or any of these pipelines is going to reduce the amount of crude that's transported by rail. The fossil fuel companies are desperate to get this product to market, and they will ship it however they can to get it to market, and that will be by pipeline if they can get one approved, and by rail, wherever that works for them. Economically, pipelines are cheaper and they are more efficient for transporting high volumes of crude, but the rail lines are more flexible in terms of their timing and destination, and they're also faster. And when we look at what's happening right now in the oil markets and how volatile it is, we can expect that those oil companies are going to want to maintain both options. And if we expand uh, Alberta's oil sands, we should expect that we're going to have increases in both pipelines and rail lines and both are potentially dangerous to people and our environment. And this project, its lifespan, they want to have it running for 40 years. So imagine that every single day for the next 40 years, it's gonna be a million barrels, a million barrels, a million barrels, putting us all at risk and kind of locking us into this form of energy for a future when we're at a time where we need to be transitioning to a low carbon economy. Huge risk for people in Northwestern Ontario and around the planet for a number of reasons, uh, right from the, the likelihood of spills, which is huge, to the climate change impacts, uh, which are enough to make it so that we should really say no to the pipeline on the climate change impacts alone. Getting bitumen out of the tar sands is a really heavily energy intensive process. You have to either steam it out or di dilute it out with water and shake it out. It takes a lot of energy to get the bitumen out. And then the bitumen is like the consistency of peanut butter. And to push it through a pipeline, you have to dilute it with benzene and other hydrocarbons, light hydrocarbons, to make it flow. But the process of just getting that oil out of the tar sands, it would be like putting 7 million more cars on the road, or like reopening every coal-fired generating station in Ontario. So it would be a huge step backwards, 30 million tons of carbon dioxide a year, just from getting the bitumen out of the tar sands that would go through this pipeline. And it's kind of a rip it and ship it kind of thing that's happening. There are little or no benefits other than short-term construction jobs for us here. It's a 40-year-old pipe that comes through this area and uh, we know that by other accidents that have happened in other areas that that pipe is subject to corrosion after 40 years and uh, 
that this is not a good idea. Most of the problems in these old pipes, and this is an old pipe, come from stress corrosion cracking. And that's something that happens mostly with the old system of protecting the pipe from the elements. So these pipes are buried underground and they're in, in wet environments and acidic environments. The newer pipe has a baked on coating that seems to be fairly resistant to, to this stress corrosion cracking. But the old pipe has a poly polyethylene tape kind of coating and it sags off or it tents up off and it separates from the pipe. And what that does is it, it lets moisture get in and you get these little hairline cracks that get deeper and they grow. I think we should be very wary of uh, promises made by TransCanada. They have a record that we should be taking notice of. The National Energy Board said that between 2000 and 2012, there were 184 accidents on TransCanada's natural gas pipeline, and about 28% of those were in Northern Ontario. So we must take everything TransCanada says with a grain of salt. They will frame things in the best way they can to make it look like this is a benefit to Canadians and to people in Thunder Bay. But what we know is we can expect diluted bitumen to spill on our watersheds, into our rivers, uh, into, the, into the places where nobody goes very, very frequently up in the north. So those small leaks, they won't even detect them. And it'll take how many months or years before somebody comes by, sees that there's a leak and reports it. Uh, and then TransCanada will put their spill management into effect and we'll see what happens. Unfortunately, most of the jobs that are available in Thunder Bay are going to come in spill cleanup, and that's not the way you want to uh, run your economy. Bitumen is not a perfect fit for railways because it's really heavy. They either have to have heated rail cars, of which there are very few in Canada, or they have to dilute the bitumen with all kinds of very toxic light hydrocarbons. Uh, the chief component of the diluent that they put in is benzene, which is a known carcinogen. Um, and if there were a spill, and if there were water involved in that, the bitumen will largely sink to the bottom, but the benzene will mix with the water and flow wherever that water is going. So the benzene could very easily end up in the water supply, even a water supply many, many miles from the original source of this bill. Where we're standing today is we are behind one river, but across Canada this pipeline will go under many rivers. And not too long ago we could see the rivers flowing quickly, but not too long ago it was frozen. In the winter that creates a lot of difficulty in cleaning up these oil spills because we know if there's a spill underwater the bitumen will sink and you're going to have a frozen layer. In Lake Superior we see ice is deep. So if we were to clean that up, it's, it's, it's a disaster waiting to happen and I don't want to see that in my lifetime. TransCanada Pipelines has unfortunately, in their 30,000 page submission, put a lot of things in about emergency response plans and things like that. But everything they put in seems to deal with bitumen as if it was crude oil. And it isn't. Crude oil floats on the surface of the water when it, when it hits it, it's lighter than water. But bitumen isn't. And when you dilute the bitumen, sometimes it, it'll float for a while, but as the lighter things evaporate off, the bitumen sinks like it did in the Kalamazoo River. And so TransCanada said weird things in their report like, well, if there's ice on the waterway, the undulations under the ice will trap the oil and it will be easier to clean up because it'll be trapped there under the ice. But we know from driving across the Nipigon River Bridge or looking at, at the Dog River flowing by, most water isn't standing still. If we get a spill into those waterways, it's going to be washed downstream. It's going to be in our Lake Superior, which is our water supply for Thunder Bay. There's uh, fish spawning grounds, sensitive grounds all over the place. This will be a major disaster that's really impossible to clean up. Well, we have to be worried about the fish. We have to be worried about the animals. And in the case of the diluent, we have to be worried about the people who are uh, dependent on that water supply. If there were a spill, that went into the Dog River, for example. The Dog River goes into Dog Lake, comes across the Dog Lake, goes down through a series of rivers, ends up in the Kaministiquia River, which ends up in Lake Superior, from which Thunder Bay draws its drinking water. And uh, water treatment plants have no way to remove those kinds of 
it's a solvent basically. They have no way to remove that from the water. So even the most advanced water treatment plants, and of which Thunder Bay is fortunate to have one, um, can't get rid of that benzene. So it will be in our drinking water and it will travel all the way. It'll travel wherever the water goes. If there's a leak and that happens, in the north somewhere, first of all, is detection. Are we going to be able to detect it in time? Secondly, the impact on the environment could be catastrophic, depending on where it happens. And if it's at nighttime, if it's during a storm, if it's winter time, there's a whole bunch of issues that revolve around those type of uh, accidents that happen with pipelines. That's why I'm, I'm against that type of situation. With a train, yeah, there could be derailments, etc. but you're limited in terms of the amount of volume that is lost. Personally, we shouldn't even be doing that, shipping the, the, the raw materials out of our country. We should be developing it here in our own country and get rid of both options. So it's a really, really hazardous plan. Right now on the planet, we need to be moving quickly away from burning fossil fuels. And the tar sands is one of the dirtiest fossil fuels on the planet. So when we need to be moving away, building the pipeline would be moving towards and locking us into that future for the next 30 or 40 years. We are responsible for our actions the things that we do, but we're also responsible for the things that we don't do. And so when we look at the fact of climate change and the fact that uh, virtually all over the world stop scientists to say there's a serious business and we have to pay attention, then we have to pay attention. And it's not just a problem that's out there somewhere. If we can prevent a new pipeline from expanding the tar sands and creating more toxic waste and creating more greenhouse gases, then we have made a difference. It's a really bad idea. Uh, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has told us where we're heading. If we do nothing about climate change, we're heading to a future with uh, major disruption in the climate system, with millions of climate refugees, um, societal breakdown. We know this is coming if we do nothing, if we continue on the path that we're on. And so building massive new fossil fuel infrastructure is a really, really bad idea. We should be going in the other direction, and we could be going in the other direction. We're saying to ourselves, why are we using uh, energies from our Earth? Why can't we use renewable energies? Why can't we use wind, solar, fuel cells, etc.? Why aren't we doing that? Yeah, we, we, we unfortunately we have a situation in Canada where the federal government is cheerleading for big oil. Some of the provincial governments are taking cautious steps towards the new economy and, and towards change. Some municipalities, including the, the uh, municipality here in Thunder Bay, actually are very progressive with thinking about adapting to climate change and also our role in, in making the change. So Thunder Bay generates a whole lot of energy from solar photovoltaic, a huge farm at the airport. Uh, we need to support that. That's, that's a really excellent thing that's happening. So it seems we know exactly which direction we should be going in. Why is it then that we are hesitant to change? The money! <laughs> this way the here, money. what the we're money. doing! Because I'm up here to make my money, I, I bought a truck, pay cash for it. And I get paid awesome, so I'm laughing. I love it up here. Well, I think we've, uh, we've gone into a very difficult economic time. We're not out of it yet. And my experience has been that environmental issues that I've been concerned with rise in public interest when times are good. But the minute e the economy goes down, then right away we forget everything else and the economy becomes everything. So I think the, uh, it, what we've got to realize now is that the economic consequences are also enormous environmental consequences. You can't separate them as if, oh, we've got to focus on the economy now and forget about the environment. They're deeply intertwined and we have to bring that discussion back to the fore. But right now with the kind of wonky economic times, Canadians don't seem that interested in, in engaging. The Minister of the Environment and Climate Change in Ontario has said that we can go towards that four degrees or we can make big steps to move away from the fossil fuel economy. And that the move to the low carbon economy will actually inject six trillion dollars of new money because we'll be developing renewable energy, we'll be doing energy retrofits, we'll be putting people to work in clean energy instead of in the old dirty energy. It's really something that we should be looking at uh, and moving quickly towards for the youth today who have a, an uncertain job future, for every species on the planet that's impacted by climate change, and for humans ourselves.
but the technology is changing, the times are changing, and we're getting better and better at that, and I'd like to see our economy develop to, to match the, the, the technologies that are out there. We're so reliant on our resources, it's pathetic. At some point, we're gonna run out. And when we run out, we better have a plan B. Right now, we don't have a plan B. Some of the most important reasons why this pipeline should never go through is one, the impacts to the climate. We know that we need to keep the tar sand oil in the ground. We don't have much space left in the atmosphere to keep on pushing this stuff out if we want to keep our globe under a two degree, under a three, four degree increase in global average temperature. And so we're at a time where we know we should be putting this out, so we shouldn't be locking ourselves in for the next 40 years. This is a time where we need to be embracing and going full force into green energies and green technologies and not polluting with, with fossil fuels and with bitumen. And another reason is um, to protect our waters and lake. If we're putting a million barrels every single day of bitumen that's flowing under every single river from Fort McMurray to New Brunswick. That's every watershed in our country. And that's what we live on and what is so necessary and fundamental to life. The expansion of the tar sands and the Energy East Pipeline, they're not meant to benefit Canadians anyway. They're meant largely for export and a corporation will get very, a number of corporations will get very wealthy. Canadians need to be thinking about what's going to happen next. We've got to move away from fossil fuels and into a greener economy. We need renewable energy to, pr to be providing our power sources. We need to retrofit uh, and make our buildings much more energy efficient. We have to do city design differently. There's a lot of things that we can be moving towards that are really, really positive. And we stand in Ontario at the cusp of, of that transition right now. We know the future has to be different. We know some of what it's going to look like and we seem hesitant or resistant to move in those directions. If we get moving in those directions, we can be amongst the leaders, we can have a strong economy with good jobs for people in, uh, in industries like uh, Bombardier here in Thunder Bay, where we're making uh, ra rapid public transit infrastructure. We need more of that in a world that's going to tackle climate change seriously. If we don't do that, we know the cons consequences aren't great. So what's stopping us from moving in that direction? This is the thing, we know that there's a lot of will to change. We had a climate walk here in Thunder Bay in September, September 21st. 375 people came out to walk in that to show that they want change, to show that they're concerned about the climate. We need politicians and leaders to get on board and help us move, because individual people can't solve this problem alone. You can't decide to not buy something or that you're gonna bike for a week or bike all the time and fix the problem. We need to change the systems of the way we, we use energy and the way we work. The third party that the Ontario Energy Board hired to look at the submission of TransCanada said we have to look with a high degree of caution at everything TransCanada has said, especially around jobs. Very few jobs will come up here, but what jobs are at risk in our tourism industry and in our recreation? We're used to thinking of Thunder Bay as a beautiful, pristine environment not as an environment where there's a major tar sands oil spill that we're trying to clean up. TransCanada has dipped into their very deep pockets to initiate this huge advertising campaign. I mean, we hear about Energy East on the internet, it's on TV, it's on the radio. And uh, I guess it's been successful for them in the sense that most Canadians now know that Energy East has, is happening. However, I think it's sort of backfired and I don't think it's resulted in what they wanted to get out of it. A recent poll that was done in Ontario showed that about three out of four people in Ontario think it's more important to protect the climate than to support the expansion of the tar sands or these pipelines. I'm sure they've been surprised at how much local uprising there's been against this pipeline. In Ontario, there are groups from Kenora, Thunder Bay to North Bay to Cornwall and you know everywhere in between on this pipeline who are voicing serious concern about the wisdom of first expanding Alberta's tar sands and also to converting a pipeline that was designed to carry natural gas to now carry diluted bitumen. The main thing we have to get clear is that the people who are selling this pipeline are saying that the, the bitumen is going to come out of the ground anyway. It's safer to send it by pipe than by rail. But the problem is that the bitumen is not going to come out of the ground anyway. The Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers has said 
the, for the tar sands to expand in the way that is planned, a tripling of the tar sands, there needs to be a whole bunch of pipelines. So if we stop the pipeline, it's not that that bitumen is all going to be transported in some other way. We'll be actually stopping the tar sands from expanding, which is really, really important. I have three grandchildren and they can't speak for themselves. So I'm a retiree. I have nothing to lose. I certainly can speak for myself and speak for them. Well, the argument's been made, um, and it was made particularly by NOMA. They were in favor of the Energy East pipeline because they said it was a safe, safer way to transport oil than uh, rail, railways. And NOMA represents a lot of communities, that smaller communities in the north, and most of us have uh, major rail lines running right through the center of town. So um, this is a, a logical concern because we know that most of what is being shipped by rail is the fracked oil or shale oil as the industry would have us call it um, from southern Saskatchewan and northern North Dakota. It's a very dirty oil to produce but it's a very volatile oil, highly explosive, um, produces toxic gases in the air and the oil is full of nasty chemicals as well and that is largely what what is shipped by rail. Trans-Canada Pipeline has a really terrible record uh, with, with spills and pipeline incidents and they'll tell you that don't worry we have state-of-the-art technology we can shut this pipeline down quickly we'll only after 10 minutes after an alarm sounds because of a pressure drop the, the humans at the control center in Calgary will initiate shutdown It'll only take 12 minutes to shut all the valves and stop the oil. So they claim that this pipeline has 22 minutes. We know from the record that that's really, really an optimistic best case scenario and it's not going to happen like that. For example, the Beardmore blast in February of 2011, which isn't very far from Thunder Bay, somebody called TransCanada to tell them that there'd been a massive explosion on their pipeline. Some short time after that, their alarms picked up that there was a problem and about 15 minutes after the call they started to shut down that pipe. Nine hours later they finally had the fire put out. This is they had leaky valves, they had things that weren't working the way they thought they would. That's what happens in the real world when you try to shut down one of these pipelines. In, in a similar circumstance a different company, Enbridge's line 6B and uh, spilled bitumen at the Kalamazoo, uh, the Kalamazoo River in Michigan it spilled for 17 hours. Their alarms went off, they ignored the alarms, the pipe kept leaking. It was a massive spill of diluted bitumen. It sank to the bottom of the Kalamazoo River. And they spent three years and a billion dollars trying to clean it up. The river will never be back to normal. It, it, they can't recover it. Probably one of the most notable leaks on record locally was the Beardmore Blast in 2011. And in spite of all of the promises about how quickly these uh, accidents and leaks could be responded to, it took nine hours for TransCanada to stop that leak and extinguish the fire. And the concern is, of course, that this is going to be diluted bitumen, not natural gas. It's heavy, it's toxic, it's really difficult to clean up. If the same kind of accident happened with this product in the pipeline, the uh, consequences would be much more serious. There's a real lack of information for the public about what is transported by rail, like when it's transported, those sorts of things. So it's hard to really get to the bottom of, uh, of what's happening with that. Is like so. We were to, we've been told in Thunder Bay the city doesn't know until a month after that those materials have been transported what actually went through. It's sort of a need, you're on a need to know basis. It's a, it's a real risk. Like we should know what's what's being transported through our community. Most definitely. Especially at least the volumes, because you know right now people aren't really aware how much is actually going through, and then you see these accidents happening. And in fact, uh, one of the benefits of rail lines that the industry has stated is that it requires very little public interface because there's actually no public consultation required in order to initiate the shipment of crude by rail. Um, so, you know, we're very concerned about that, but we just don't think that the argument that if, if uh, we allow the pipeline to go through, that the rail shipping is going to diminish. There's no evidence that that is going to be the case. To take anything TransCanada said with a great deal of caution, 
there will be virtually no economic impact for northwestern Ontario where they're only trying to convert the pipe, they're not putting in a new one. Fossil fuel companies are so desperate to get this oil out to market. They, uh, they know that this is a dying industry. Thunder Bay has a boom and bust economy. We need, you know, the, the, the jobs argument is, is very appealing. We need people to stay in the region. Good jobs are important, but we have to, to stop believing the what the companies say and take a good, good cold hard look at it and make good decisions for the region. So I, I would like to see communities getting together, talking about the risks and putting a stop to this project. We've seen some great um, examples of how local de direct democracy, civil action, getting together grassroots movements that have already put a delay on this project. We saw the people in Kakuna, Quebec, who were, there was intended to be a, a port built at that city, and they said, you know, we have the St. Lawrence River here, we have a critical beluga whale habitat where they come and they, they breed, and this is part of our culture, this is who we are as Canadians, we, this is something we value, and we don't want to have huge tankers coming in here and, uh, and risking that and, and throwing off the cycles. And, and so the people in that town came together in thousands and were in the streets, and you know this Trans Canada has put a delay on their project for two years so they're still putting a ton of effort they still want this project to go through but I think that two-year delay is is a win for or for people because as long as we can push this project delayed I mean the closer it is to in my opinion is that it's not going to go through 2011 uh, the government the federal government decided to close the experimental lakes area research station out near Vermilion Bay and um, a young lady named Diane Orahill, who had worked at the research station, uh, crisscrossed Canada, uh, explaining why this was so important to keep the ELA open. It had a worldwide reputation for uh, leading edge research regarding impacts on the environment. So for example, uh, they discovered that phosphorus in our uh, detergents was what was causing kill zones in lakes uh, because it, it caused these algae blooms. And so she put her life on hold for six months and uh, came through Thunder Bay and local groups supported her as did groups around the world. And uh, because of those efforts uh, and the uh, grassroots activism that arose out of it, uh, the Experimental Lakes area is now open and conducting uh, world-class aquatic research. So uh, that was the direct result of uh, grassroots bottom-up uh, resistance to something which was not a good idea. So if you jump forward to the present day, we're on the cusp of history again. Uh, the pipeline people want to build uh, Energy East. And I think now is a critical time when we see the price of oil that has, has fallen. Is a critical time when we need to be transitioning. Let's take this opportunity where it's not so profitable to making money off of bitumen and other dirty energies like fracking and coal and let's subsidize green energy. Let's get that transition to low carbon economy happening today. There's people in Thunder Bay who are working on this and people can go online and do some research and find out how to connect with us. We have been working with City Council to get them to pass a resolution just coming out and making a symbolic statement against it because you know every community that comes out is another obstacle for trans candidates, another event and statement. More people are are becoming aware of the risks of this pipeline. So talking to your friends, if, you're, if you hear people talking at coffee, family dinners, you know, you don't have to be in the streets protesting. If, if you want to come, great. Well, the more people, the bigger impact, the more politicians will have to listen and, you know, we can, we can make it so this project doesn't have the social license in this country. Uh, you can go to our websites, uh, Council of Canadians, Thunder Bay Chapter, Environment North, uh, Citizens United for a Sustainable Planet, Ontario Nature, uh, Fossil Free Lakehead, all of those sites uh, give you lots of information about what our position is. Economy or ecology seems to be the question. The answer is everywhere we look. People want to preserve our environment, but we also need a thriving economic driver. So what if we launched ourselves into the future? Our energy infrastructure is outdated, so let's update it. 
by asking all our local power providers to join forces, becoming an amalgamated social enterprise. We could rebuild Northwestern Ontario's entire energy infrastructure, using the resources of yesterday to help us build an emergent tomorrow. If Bombardier Transportation began the conversation of a cross-Canada magnetically levitating train, we could create thousands of jobs nationwide. Although this all may sound a little outlandish to some, it seems to be the norm for most young people in our region. In fact, people of all ages are buzzing about change in today's reality. As we grow holistically towards a brighter future, embracing all cultures and our planetary mother, we see the importance of planning for seven generations.